here, this shows the number of males that reproduce, that produce offspring at different ages. Okay, and they begin to reproduce at about five years old, but not very many males do. By about 10 years old, uh, they produce quite a few offspring. But at that time, most of them will have done that outside of their mother's group, outside of their family group. Okay, here's the age at which males leave their, their mother's family. Most of them leave before they're five years old. But you'll see that a few of them stick around even till 15 years old, even 16, 17 years old. Very few of them. But, so, but overall, the pattern shows that most males leave their mother's group before they actually reproduce, which means inbreeding is prevented, simply by the fact that males disperse from their natal group. They go elsewhere. And this pattern is common in most mammals, um, be it whatever, whatever mammal you want to look at. But the interesting thing is this phase, this, this thing right here, this section of the curve right here. There are males that um, stay in their mother's group way past the age when they're capable of actually reproducing and siring offspring. And they do sire offspring. They do sire offspring in their mother's group after, <coughs> um, during this particular phase. All right. So what we, have, what we come up with here is that males dispersing from their fam female relatives is a major factor to prevent inbreeding. But this overlap area that I just showed you in the last slide suggests that there are still possibilities for inbreeding. Um, but they seem to avoid it. Now why do, how do these mechanics avoid inbreeding and do they? So let's look at the next slide here. All right, this shows um, the avoidance of inbreeding among talk mechanics, all right? This shows the relationship between the male and the female. So this, the male mating with a close maternal kin, in other words, a male mating with its mother or its aunt or its half-sister or its niece, or here a male mating with its cousin, or here a male mating with its own daughter, which is high, highly unlikely, and with his half-sister. And here are the number of males that, are, that have the chance to do that or that they're involved in the sample. And here we have three, these male, a male had 300, or males have 369 chances to mate with a mother or an aunt or a half sister or a niece. But only one of them did and reproduced an offspring. They had 1,432 chances to mate with non offspring, and 94 actually did so. The, the significant, the difference here is highly, highly significant. It, sh it shows that males, given a choice, when they have the opportunity even to mate with close relatives, they don't. There's some behavioral mechanism that goes on that prevents them from, from doing so. Um, and the similar, you have a similar argument here for distant relatives. Now, distant relatives, cousins, for example, uh, there is no significant difference here. Here, 2.5% offspring produced with cousins, and 2.5% uh, um, uh, produced with, uh, with unrelated females. So at the level of the cousins, the males and females don't discriminate. It's okay to marry a cousin, but not a, a close relative. Uh, when it comes to daughters, the, the, the occasions for males to mate with a daughter are very rare because the, 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 the males, uh, the adult males and fathers leave their, mother, their daughter's group uh, on a regular basis, so there's really not much chance. But sometimes the demographics are such that there is an opportunity, but when there is an opportunity, um, you notice that the males do not avoid uh, this, do not avoid inbreeding with their or breeding with their daughters, uh, nor with their paternal half sisters. At least, not in a statistical sense. If you look at the actual data, uh, only 3.2 percent of males who had this opportunity did so, uh, as opposed to 8 percent who did not. Um, uh, similarly, um, but statistically, the sample is too small uh, to bring this to significance level. But never mind. The point here is that. There is some sort of behavioral mechanism where, where animal, where a macaque, a male and a female toad macaque, recognize one another as relatives, or not as relatives, as something that they shouldn't be mating with. And I just said this, so we'll just skip this. All right, in human parallels, um, in all cultures, uh, it's, there's a taboo against uh, marrying close, uh, close relatives. And most of us think that, wow, okay, this taboo arises because our preachers and our, <clears throat> our, our cultural leaders tell us to do so. But what I'm telling you here is that this is an inbred, this is a genetically determined trait. This has got nothing to do with culture. Automatically, we don't tend to breed 
uh, uh, produce offspring with close relatives. It's not a cultural trait. Um, the, the other question that is begs here, how, how do these animals recognize one another? How does, how does a son know, how does a male know that this is a half-sister and this is a cousin? How does he discriminate? Um, and I don't know. So that's something for you all to find out in the next, uh, next 10, 15 years. Um, some ideas are through close association. Of course, that's the easiest. If you're closely associated with a female, then you, as you get older, you avoid it. And that's also true in humans, by the way. Uh, very few marriages occur among uh, people who have, were together in, as school children, for example. Um, so that's this early association is, uh, is something that does something to the brain. Uh, another possibility is that the males recognize one another, or the females males recognize one another as relatives by way of odor. There is a, in mice, for example, there is a gene called the uh, the main histocompatibility complex gene, heck of a name which encodes for the immune system. <clears throat> and associated with this encoding is also an odor, an individual specific odor. And it's been shown in mice, for example, that um, males, <clears throat> males and females have with certain odors are avoided. And these, these odors are, they communicate a degree of relatedness. Uh, and the last thing that might happen is by phenotypic matching, they look alike, but I don't put much uh, much faith in that. So, uh, you have your work cut out for you. I'm going to leave. <laughs> um, I've done 40 years. This is enough. You can find out why monkeys don't, what, what monkeys uh, use uh, to prevent themselves from, from inbreeding. And um, I want to thank all these people, along with the, the IFS, for example, uh, most of all, and also a list of um, people who have assisted me in this, uh, in this work. And I would, uh, if you want to know more about monkeys and what we do, and how you might help, uh, look at our website. It's called www.primates.lk, not .com, but .lk. And one last word, and that is one of conservation. Now, there's a big problem in Sri Lanka with monkeys coming to houses and being, and being a nuisance. And part of the problem, it's not the monkey's fault, you know. Part of the problem is that people leave a lot of garbage around them. And uh, in Kandy, for example, there are open garbage pits everywhere. And this is a bonanza of food for monkeys. The population of macaques in, in Kandy and in other towns has exploded simply because of all this garbage lying around. You get rid of the garbage and you won't have a monkey problem. The other thing that you shouldn't do, I know you feel pow for monkeys when you go to places like Polanguru, Dambulani, Pau, Malandako. Um, don't give the monkeys any food. You're setting that monkey up for a death sentence. You may feel power, and you will give it some rice, your leftover rice. You know, you don't want to eat it and give it to the monkey. But what happens is the monkey then begins to learn that ah, oh, I should I should be able to eat rice from humans anyway. And he goes to the neighboring village and he tries to take the rice from them. Well, they're not happy about that because they you know they, they don't want to share it with the monkey. And eventually they get so angry they retaliate and they poison them. So by feeding a monkey by practicing even, you know, if you want to buy a better life in your next life, if you want to buy merit for your next life, by giving monkey uh, food to a monkey, don't do that. You're not buying merit. You're actually killing that monkey indirectly. You're not buying merit. Don't do it for religious or sentimental or other purposes. Because you're setting that monkey up to be killed by other people who don't have the same kind of sentiment. Uh, thank you. I'm open for questions. Yes, absolutely. Is there any study about homosexual activity among lesbians? Um, yes, uh, there are some studies about homosexual activity in monkeys. Uh, obviously, it doesn't lead to any lead to any uh, offspring um, among the same-sex partners. Um, but homosexuality and masturbation is found primarily in those monkeys where the males don't have access to the females year-round. Uh, now, that's not to say that homosexuality is an unnatural event. That's not what I'm going to say here at all. It's, in humans, it's, you know, there are genetic bases for sexual choice, for gender choice in, 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 in humans. Um, but apart from that, no, in monkeys there isn't much, uh, uh, isn't much evidence for that. And it would be something that would, that would be selected against by the natural selection, simply because 
any behavior that diverts a male's attention away from reproducing with a female is a is he loses an opportunity to produce an offspring, which means he loses an opportunity to pr promote copies of his genes to the future generations. And so, in other words, it would be naturally be selected that way. He would be weeded out eventually. That behavior would not be genetically encoded. <laughs> you are all other students? Don't have any questions? Are you? What is this? <laughs> Who has monkeys in their gardens? <laughs> Who has monkeys in their gardens? What? Nobody here has monkeys. You're all living in downtown Colombo. <laughs> Speaking lousy singer, you could at least ask me. A... Uh, yes. In fact, they'll mate a little bit more during East, during even during the menstrual cycle because there's an East, there's an estrogen peak during men during menstruation and the female smells good, so um, males come. Do they have an instinctive awareness of the peak fertility? Peak fertility. Uh, yes, they seem to have, uh, the, the females at least, uh, and, and the males, it's not just instinctive, yeah, okay, it's, it's, it's also signal. It's signaled by pheromones and dopamine and other primates is signaled by, you know, large uh, visual signals. But, uh, I mean, the interesting thing is that females will mate with most males on most occasions when it doesn't matter, when um, it does not lead to conception. Now, when it when it comes when it, when the mating when she's in peak estrus when she's about to conceive, then she's very choosy as who she mates with, and she won't just allow any fellow to come. She will select a certain male that she thinks is going to be a, uh, is going to be has the qualities uh, uh, for her, and the quality that she looks for isn't whether he's a good looking or handsome. He can be a a grubby looking old male. What she looks for is some sort of social, some sort of behavioral traits that assure her that he's going to be around for the next four or five years in the group strong enough to be able to protect her and her offspring from other males who might be willing, who might be uh, uh, wishing to kill her. Infant. So she looks, for, she looks for good providers. That's what she looks for. She doesn't look for a handsome fellow, or, but she looks for a good provider. Yeah, just like that. She looks for a rich fellow. No? That might be ugly. If he has a bench, never mind. Monkeys reproduce between the between among the different species. No, I mean, this black monkey and the white monkey. Uh, uh, not usually, no. Because you know why? Normally, uh, animals don't hybridize because all right, each species of animal is designed by its genes to make a living in the environment in a certain way. It has qualities such as the shape.